And welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with it's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org Consequence and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thank you so much as always for making your way here, checking out the series. You know what to do. If you like what you see, like what you hear, hit that subscribe button. I put out three new interviews every single week. So it's a great way to keep up with all of your favorite artists. I'm so excited to once again be talking with Nick Offerman, who's back with a brand new uh, book. I almost said brand new album, uh, Where the Deer and the Antelope Play. Hello, sir. Hello there. It's great to see you again. I've got the uh, the book over my shoulder. And um, so I got to tell you, first off, uh, and, and I usually save the compliments for later, but this is such an important piece of work that you've done. Um, and it completely, it completely resonated with me in a hardcore way. So first off, thank you for, uh, for tackling this uh, very big subject uh, that we're going to get into. And there's a lot to, but um, yeah, thanks. That's, that's the way this starts. <laughs> Oh, well, my my pleasure. I'm I'm glad it resonated with you. It's a uh, it's a tough thing to do, um, especially as an entertainer, to try and uh, you know to try and sneak this kind of broccoli into my particular pizza. Um, but I, I I try to do my best to do it with common sense and affection for my fellow humans. And I think you know. I'd give myself maybe an 83% success on this one, which is an improvement. <laughs> I'll um, point out at the beginning here. So I'm, I'm in Louisville and uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And I, I only point that out um, for you viewers and listeners, because as the book starts, uh, you're sitting uh, with the, uh, the Berry household, Wendell Berry, the, uh, the author, uh, nature author. Uh, you also talk about Sam Shepard, an adopted Kentuckian who, uh, who, uh, Spent his last days here in Lexington. Uh, it was <clears> nice <throat> seeing Kentucky, I guess, playing a big part of this because it also has you kind of traversing the globe. I, so how do you explain the book? I don't want to say this is a book about nature because it's not. This is a book about a whole lot of things. I, I, uh, and I said, I want to get into this, but, but what's, the, uh, what's the dust jacket version of, uh, of what we're getting at here? Well, I mean, it's, it's specifically about our, our place in nature or our, our um, ignorance to our place in nature. Um, a lot of the things that are plaguing human civilization these days can be traced back to the way we treat our natural resources. And most of us, me included, I've spent most of my life sort of blithely ignorant to that relationship. Uh, which is what capitalism and and uh, consumerism have done to us. We are we've been able to become very comfortable buying our stuff, eating our stuff, wearing our stuff, throwing our stuff. Uh, once in a while, we notice that some of our stuff developed a big island of plastic in the ocean, but we can put that out of our minds because there's fantasy football, and you know, and so it's it's trying to focus back on uh on our relationship as part of nature to refresh our our memories to the fact that we're part of the ecosystem of the planet and when people say we need to save the planet i would say no the planet is not going any place it's just fine it's us <laughs> that we need to worry about um and I, I'm such a big fan of, of Kentucky. Thank you for pronouncing Louisville correctly. Uh, I've, I've been taken to task many times uh, <laughs> until I, I learned to get it right. But it was just, just east uh, in Henry County where the, uh, the inciting question for this book took place. And I'm from Illinois, uh, farm country, and so I've always found Kentucky to be exceptionally beautiful. And um, and a, a great sort of hotbed of you know the the north meets the south and uh, the the woods meet the fields and um, and so I, I think it's a great place as the the birth of of these ideas for me. Yeah, one thing I really appreciate the book, and again, uh, kind of spelling it out for those who who haven't yet read it or heard it or spent the fifteen minute version on some dumb website uh, that. <laughs> version of it um as you're saying you are talking about our connection with nature uh it's also as i as i really enjoyed about this book it's also a way um looking at nature and looking how we've treated nature as a way to relearn our own history and i say that in a way of sort of the um people's history of the united states sort of way because you are able to reapproach history from the oppressed uh, from the minority, whether we're talking about the beautiful national parks who are 
taken away from the uh, the uh, the Native Americans, and I say that on Indigenous uh, Indigenous Day here, so that's that's interestingly timed. But um, like, was that automatically part of your approach that you wanted to take? Not necessarily. I mean, uh, that's all you know. It's you know, it's, that's one of the sort of big ticket items that exists. You know, uh, until until it's done, until until the world can say, okay, reparations have been made, like everything is now cool, which I don't, I don't know that that could ever happen completely. And so that's always on my mind. It's one of the things, you know, that, that we need to pay attention to as a society, but it really came, it really hit home when I got to Glacier National Park and, you know, began to dig into the history and, and saw, oh, okay, the, the, beautifully pristine you know uh gorgeous natural setting is only this way because we europeans scraped the people out of it uh brutally and and uh, shamefully and so the 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 agrarian that i get to in the book aldo leopold uh who did most of his great work in madison wisconsin um talked about how we can never lose sight of the fact that we and what we grow and what we consume, we're all all of we're all part of the same batch of molecules. You know, in a hundred years, I may be your grandson, or or we both may become redwood trees, or way, who knows what. So, you know, we're all part of this incredible batch, this uh, this incredible organic soup. Um, and so when you when you think about that, uh, it he says that every every uh, piece of nature is, is a cog or a wheel in this sort of great creation. And so if you look at the way we treat our farm animals and factory farming, for example, it's not dissimilar from the uh, insensitivity with which we've treated indigenous peoples or the, the people that we enslaved uh, in the early part of this country. Slavery still exists. Like, it's all it all comes from the same uh empathy or lack of empathy to say well this you know the blackfeet tribe doesn't uh doesn't matter we don't need to worry about their votes or their rights they're less than human let's let's brutalize them so we can take their stuff uh these pigs we don't care about these pigs let's let's give them horrible lives because all that really matters is that we make as much money as we can off of their their pork and it's all it's just it's all connected you know the, these mountains don't matter nobody lives here so let's chop the top off con consume all the coal and and destroy the ecosystem doesn't matter nobody's here etc um mm. so it's it's just it's trying to dig into our our folly and ignorance with a sense of humor <laughs> and that should be pointed out there is a lot of humor in the book I, I know as we get into this uh interview maybe it doesn't seem like that but it's nick offerman i i promise you there's a lot of funny parts in this um i'm not going to get to those right now uh, <laughs> as far as my questioning goes because again the things you're talking about did resonate with me i and i only bring this up i know you're a well-read uh big reader and I, don't, I i bring a book up i don't know if you've read it or not actually brought it behind me here but when i was 15 or 16 i read this book ishmael by a guy, a guy named daniel quinn that's and, so uh, funny i um my friend diana rogers who has an amazing book called sacred cow that's also a documentary uh, i talk about it in the book in my book uh, and I narrate the documentary. She sent me a hardcover of that book that I'm I ha it's sitting right over there because that's my next uh, for for eighteen months. I'm like, yes, I'm going to read it like as soon as my book is <laughs> clear. so that's that's a very prescient uh, that's a very uh, great piece of serendipity. yeah, tell well, me, that tell me well, about Ishmael right. Ishmael, and I'm gonna bring up the uh, the sequel. In fact, there's a whole series of books, and this is only parts one and two, the story of B. This is the, so Ishmael, what it does is basically say how we came to be here as humans. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's the the main setup. and and what it does, and and the way it works with with your book is it paints the big picture, how we came to be here. What I love about your book specifically is it puts it in real life everyday moments. Uh, it fits so well into this. The story of B, uh, my personal favorite because he also weaves fiction in with this. It's sort of in, in that way. Uh, the story B talks about uh, agriculture. Um, 
it talks about uh, population, um, too much of it. Uh, but the the one thing that we get to learn in these books, I think one of the most important things and what we're getting, what I'm getting at here with you is um, civilization as civilization started when we learned to put food under lock and key. Once you have food locked up, you have ultimate power. And it's mm. it's so interesting, especially again, when I get into the everyday details of what you're talking about in your book here of how interconnected how we grow our food and what we do with it versus everything that's happening in our society right now. So, so you got that it's, going for you. <laughs> it is. No, it's, that's, a, it's a great point. It's all, it's all inseparable. Um, the way, and once you lock up food, then, then you are, then you are no longer treating people. You're not, you're not, no longer making everybody has a beer at the party. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you do that, then you have unhappy revelers, uh, and before you know it, we're uh, we're shooting at each other. Right, right. Well, again, you know, for, so for those of you all watching and listening, so so here we have these moments. And at one point in part one of the book, you are on uh, in the Glacier National Park, as you pointed out, uh, with George Saunders and uh, Jeff Tweedy. And I'll bring up Jeff Tweedy because this is a consequence of sound series. And I should probably talk about music a little bit here. <laughs> But what I really loved about it, it's sort of figuring out once it was happening is here's a series of you all being on trails and kind of discovering this part of the world. But each trail allows you to take on a different, bigger subject. And again, I would love to know, like, as you're writing this, you know, how, how did that approach end up happening? Well, I mean, this is my fifth book. And, and uh, when people ask me, you know, what's this new book about? I, I always say it doesn't really matter what it, like it's each of my books, uh, which I love dearly, turns out to be an excuse for me to look in the mirror and and at all of us and say, all right, we are still like can't find our ass with both hands. Like, you know, how how can we keep trying to improve? How can we like how can we just convince each other to do something as simple as like wear a mask or get vaccinated or, or some or simply gesture that we despite political differences that we simply care about one another like pure empathy and so whatever that entails whether it's talking about racism or homophobia or lgbtq rights or you know a misogyny whatever it is um I, I basically, in this case, you know, take a menu of trails and say, okay, <clears throat> the High Line Trail, here's, uh, here's, the, here's what it's like. And pretty soon something occurs to me. I, I don't, I wish I could, you know, be uh, claim to be more clever or scientific, but it's very stream of consciousness. Uh, I sort of, when I, when I sit down to write a a book, I have a set of things that I want to gripe about or that I want to bring up that that's, always involves me. I always start with, look, I'm, I'm going to make a bunch of mistakes, even in this book that you're about to read. I'm going to make a bunch of mistakes because I'm a human being and I'm just doing my best here. And if we all could remember that as a people, as a town, as a state, as a nation, as a, as a planet, I think it would be a lot easier to make progress. But Sadly, human pride drives us to say things like, well, I'm not racist. <laughs> There's not a racist bone in my body, said the politician from South Carolina. And, and you're like, well, hang on. There's no, uh, there's no shame in it, like admitting the simple truth of our history that's profoundly racist, that's simply purely racist. Like, okay, that's what happened. There's no denying it. So let's own that. And say, okay, that was messed up. So how can we make it better? How can we strive towards actually fulfilling the words we set down uh, as the foundation of this country, the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, to to truly treat everybody the same, give everybody the same sh fair shake. So that you know, it, it, I, I go at it through uh, a menu of trails through a visit with a shepherd, you know, and through uh, an Airstream trip with my wife. 
Yeah. And again, uh, uh, so I'll bring up the first one again, uh, because we're on consequence here. Uh, you have the heroic Jeff Tweedy, who uh, not only saves George's glasses in the most heroic way and falls down a glacier in the most heroic way. Um, you've got a long history, too, with Wilco uh, that I always appreciate, as you talk about in the book that goes all the way back to your fandom for, uh, for Uncle Tupelo. Uh, it's a long way. I, I'm, I'm, I'm making my way back around to what we're talking about here, but your, your choice of music, it, I, I mean, in the few times we've talked, I say in the couple times we've talked, it's, I've always felt is in line with mine. So I, I ask this sort of coming from my own background, that it sounds like at some point in your life you found uh, the alternative track. And I'm not saying that in the big radio way. <laughs> what was your coming of age music? Like, wh who were those bands and, and how did you find them in the middle of where you were? in Illinois? But boy, that's, that's, a, that's a big question. Um, I, uh, I, I grew up in a cultural vacuum and I don't, I, I say this with all sincerity, I don't really have taste. Uh, I don't really have good taste, I guess. My wife has amazing taste. She's very sophisticated and she's amazing at picking stuff. So growing up, I didn't uh, you know, I, I had an older sister and uh, older cousin, and they got to the channels of culture. This is the late 70s into the 80s. And so they were uh, anything besides the radio that I was getting, I was getting through them, which means Queen, uh, Duran Duran, uh, early George Michael, Wham, Wham UK stuff. And which I was totally down with. Then my cousin and I in the mid eighties discovered break dancing and we had a break dancing duo. So we would stay up late at night and off some Chicago radio station, we would get like early uh, nucleus grandmaster flash kind of stuff, rappers delight. And, you know, we would cassette record off the radio stuff that we could break dance to. But I, I mean, those were just my the first sips uh, coming out of the desert of my youth. Mm -hmm. And when I when I got to college in Champaign Urbana, to uh, theater school, suddenly that's where my friends, the weirdos, were like, "Oh, come in, come into the oasis. Here's Laurie Anderson. Here's early Neil Young. Here's here's David Byrne and Talking Heads, um, and uh, eventually, you know." Here's Uncle Tupelo. Here's They Might Be Giants. My they gave me They Might Be Giants. And I was like, holy shit. This like that was my that was my becoming. You know, uh -huh. if I was if I was the Highlander and my quickening was They Might Be Giants album Lincoln, where I was like, oh, my life has been solved. Uh, thank you. And so um I really tapped into just, you know. The same way that I think the thing that drives one to become a theater artist, where you're like, I want to tell stories to society to point out what's wrong with us so that we, you know, so we can try and, and be better to one another. Um, and that's just developed over the years and it's still developing. Uh, somebody, somebody gave me some Tom Waits uh, and, and I, and I was like, oh, okay, this is me. This is my life. Um, and and I'm still I'm still chasing it. Yeah, it's been ten years this year since Tom released a record. He's been having fun acting, but I'm I'm missing. I'm a greedy bastard when it comes to fandom. No, so it's... sure. <laughs> I I understand that, but at the same time, how grateful can we be for the who who else has a massive body of work that remains that profound and poignant? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll even say the same thing about They Might Be Giants. In fact, you and I did talk about them last time. They got their new um, their new album book, which I just got the box set in there and I'm looking to dive into. And uh, yeah, that's uh, th and that's that I, I, again, that's kind of what I'm getting to back around because I'm only, you know, relating to my own experience here. It was a, a Pearl Jam album yield that was based on Daniel Quinn's Ishmael that sort of led me to learn about animism that led me to le learn about agrarianism and and a bunch of other isms that go along with that. And um, I don't know if you can, it, like I said, it sounds like you were sort of getting at that, but if you can pinpoint like that moment where you started to become aware, you know, of, of, of the things that you are talking about in this book. Well, I can't, I can't, I don't think I can trace it to music. I mean, I can, tr I can trace uh, specifically um, on, uh, 
I think I think on on Lincoln by They Might Be Giants is the song Your Racist Friend. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty eye opening where I was like, oh, you can have popular culture that has like a cool social message, you know, sorry, guys, but you're going to be accused of being woke at some point. Um, hope, hope you like people who uh, who only like white people. Um, that didn't come out. Uh, hope, but that that was pretty crazy. But I it it took me a long time because I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed to like I I wouldn't hear music and say and sort of be able to apply that to my own life because of, of being dumb and. And so I was much, uh, you know, I was really into plays that that sort of had carried an empathetic message uh, of any sort, and it was and it was working on the Sam Shepard play, and somebody gave me Wendell Berry stories. It was these Wendell Berry short stories uh, that 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 was the moment that was like the slap across the face where I was like, oh, I am a storyteller, I'm an entertainer. Here's Wendell has given me this incredible example of the kind of family I grew up in, the kind of community with farming values uh, and good, honest, hardworking common sense. I, he's shown me that I can try and communicate that, that that has incredible value. And in fact, the greatest value, like I, I think I always placed popular culture in the city or like not not attached to me but wendell wendell's fiction said no actually you are in this this is in you and so from then on i've i've then made choices to try and like bring the two together and i said to wendell and his family if i if i could just have a career communicating his writing to people that would make me very happy uh but they they talked talk to me about things like copyright issues, and I said I, I understand, and they said why don't you try and write you know do your own version of this, and so we're still we're still dancing uh, in a collaborative way. Yeah. Well, again, like I said, it it resonated with me. Uh, I have the issue of just telling myself to turn off, to to stop working, to get away from this thing that I'm doing right here. Um, so we booked a couple days after I, uh, while I was in the middle of the book, we booked a couple days for next week to Red River Gorge, just to do, to walk around, to do the thing. Um, you know, and I'll wrap it up with this, just some couple things I wrote down as I'm reading it, that you can fight every battle just by making the small choices in your daily life. And the way forward starts, of course, with facing our truth. Those are my two favorite points that I've taken from this book. So again, I'm just sending those out there as a compliment to you of what this book already means to me. So, well, thank you. I I appreciate it. I mean, it's really complicated. I you know I'm I'm not the dumbest person or the smartest person, and that's true of all but two of us. Uh, and so we got to band together. There, like one tiny thing that drives me insane is the whole bottled water situation. I've got this thing, uh, this one happens to be from my wood shop, which uh, is a wonderful website, offermanwoodshop.com. But get it, I've been, I, I think I've gone through three of these in about the last five years. I take it, I tour for a living, and I don't, I just make it a rule, I don't ever use a disposable plastic bottle. We have allowed ourselves through human laziness to, to become accustomed to wherever we go, people hand us plastic bottles of water. And that's completely been done by beverage corporations. It's bananas. And that's one tiny thing. But let's, let's, let's wipe that out. I mean, just we need, to, we need to keep checking off these boxes. And um, there's a wonderful book called uh, Bottle Mania by Elizabeth Reut, R-O-Y-T-E, that gets into this. And if if, if you real if you realize, think about it. These beverage companies, mainly Nestle, are buying the water the the water <laughs> right, right from beneath our communities all over the country. Their their milkshake, you know, and there will be blood. Like they have the deepest straw. They're drinking all of our milkshakes and then selling it to us. It's it's bonkers. Uh, let's reclaim our water 
and our place as part of the natural ecosystem. That's with full culpability that we're dumb and we're going to make a lot of mistakes, but let's at least hang that as our carrot uh, instead of buying too many brightly colored athletic shoes. Well, that's what I mean. That's a small daily choice right there that anybody can do so easily. So, uh, Nick, I appreciate it so much. I look forward to the next uh, comedy moment. <laughs> Again, there's lots of that in this book, by the way. Uh, I can't uh, can't thank you enough. Congratulations on this one right here. And uh, hopefully one of these days, I know we'll see you back around this way again. With any luck. Thank you so much for having me and have a beautiful day.